It's time to get started, folks. We've got a busy agenda today. Welcome to the fifth annual meeting of the SSA's Disability Research Consortium. My name is David Stapleton. I'm the director of Mathematica's cooperative agreement with the uh, Social Security Administration under the DRC. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of my colleagues, one of them who's right here, Yanni Ben Shalom, who stepped in when we needed him to organizing uh, the sessions today. Uh, Gina Livermore, who I haven't seen yet, is uh, so, there you go. Uh, well, let's get lights here, you know, so. And, uh, uh, and also Heather Gordon, who's probably may not be in the room, but uh, has been very important to getting us organized. She's our administrator. I'd also like to especially welcome our counterparts from the National Bureau of Economic Research. I haven't seen David Otter yet. Oh, that's I have. <laughs> there he is, uh, Nicole Meistis. And uh, um, also Janet Stein, I think I saw her earlier, and, uh, and I don't know whether Richard Woodbury is here or not, but uh, welcome. And um, we have a busy agenda, as I said. We've got two one and a half hour sessions this morning, uh, one on workers' compensation and short-term disability insurance, and then after a short break, we'll go to a second one on the effect of the economy and also state policy on disability program outcomes. Uh, during lunch, we've got a great speaker, David Cutler from Harvard. Uh, we'll be talking about his work with Raj Chetty and others on uh, the effects of income on uh, mortality and its impl in the implications of the findings for uh, the disability programs. And then uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, we've got two more sessions. So um, if I can get my notes. Uh, yeah, after lunch, we've got a session on interactions between SSA's disability programs and, and other programs. Uh, and then uh, finally, a, a session on the SSA programs themselves and, and topics related to their design and, and uh, program management. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce John W.R. Phillips, who is the Associate Commissioner of the Office of Research, Evaluation, and Statistics at SSA. It's the office that has the responsibility for the Disability Research Consortium, and uh, it's an official uh, federal statistical unit within the Social Security Administration, and it's responsible for the production and dissemination of research and data on Social Security programs. Prior to joining SSA, John was at the National Institute on Aging, and uh, where he was directing the uh, intramural research program for the, the Health and Retirement Study. Uh, he's published a great deal of research on the economics of aging and with a focus on retirement and on savings adequacy and intergenerational transfers. So, John, please. Good morning, everybody. That was the audience participation part. <laughs> Good. So uh, the first thing I learned this morning is that David and I should coordinate our, 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 our talks because I'm going to say a lot of the same things that he did. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here uh, at the uh, annual meeting of the Disability Research Consortium. Welcome. Um, I am uh, John Phillips. I run the, uh, the Office of Research Evaluation and Statistics. Uh, SSA is the sponsor of both of this conference as well as the research presentations you're going to see over the next few days by some of the top researchers on Social Security policy and programs in the country. Uh, the Social Security and Supplemental Security Income Disability Programs are the largest federal programs providing income support for people with disabilities. In June of 2017, 10.5 million people received disability insurance benefits and about 6 million received disability payments from the Supplemental Security Income Program. SSA engages in research to better understand our programs and to produce evidence to support data-driven policy making to ensure that our programs are effectively serving the public. SSA developed the DRC program to serve as a national resource fostering high quality research, communication and education on matters related to disability policy. Indeed, our center-based research grant programs, which began with the Retirement Research Consortium back in the late 90s, uh, have been very successful in this regard. They expand the agency's capacity to generate an evidence base on social security programs by engaging the research community to conduct investigator-initiated analysis and disseminate findings via research publications and public events like the one that brings us together today. As you review the agenda, you might wonder how we arrived at this collection of projects. A great advantage of the cooperative nature of the DRC program is the opportunity for our agency 
to interact with the center researchers to develop areas for inquiry. Each year, the research office gathers staff from around the agency to develop a list of research topics intended to support current agency evidentiary needs for our disability programs. We then meet with the DRC leadership to discuss these focal areas as well as areas proposed by the center researchers. The result is timely research that informs both policymakers and the public about our disability programs. Research addressing focal areas from the past grant year are prominently featured on today's program with several presentations covering the issues of interactions between the Social Security Disability Programs and other public and private support programs. The first session is going to consider uh, outcomes associated with workers' compensation and short-term disability programs, including the transition from short-term to long-term disability. The second session will consider the influence of economic conditions and state policies on the SSDI program and employment. The third uh, will provide insights on how health insurance and educational supports affect SSA disability programs and beneficiaries. The final session of the day will address important topics in federal disability policy, including the significance of work-related overpayments to the SSDI program. We will allow you to eat lunch. Um, and that will occur sometime in the middle of the day, uh, but of course it's a working lunch. We'll have a presentation by Dr. David Cutler, who will uh, talk about research on the links between income and longevity, and importantly, how this relates to uh, the disability and retirement programs. So we have a very full day ahead of us. As you know, there's this coffee outside. I recommend you caffeinate. Um, the fact that we have an exciting research program um, to show you today comes in great part because of the exceptional leadership uh, that we have uh, in our center researchers. Uh, David Stapleton and his team at Mathematica, and David Autur and his team at National Bureau of Economic Research, we thank you very much for your leadership and your research. Uh, while I have the, the microphone also, I'll, I, I would take the opportunity to thank the, the center directors from the programs that you'll be hearing from tomorrow on the Retirement Research Consortium, Boston College, uh, at the MBER again, as well as the University of Michigan. Uh, and special thanks uh, to the team from Mathematica this year. They're the ones who organized the, uh, the conference. Uh, Lynn Fisher, uh, who works with an excellent program team at SSA, uh, leads our side of the, of the consortium program, along with Nancy Early, Patrick Purcell, Brad Trenkamp, Francois Becker, and Nick Love. Thank you for your efforts. If you're here, uh, please stand and, and be recognized. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. Uh, we also want to thank our partners in the Office of Acquisition and Grants. I'm not sure if Audrey and any of her team are here. They may be watching on, on the live stream, so hi, Audrey, thank you. Um, finally, uh, merit review is a very, very important part uh, of making a successful grant program. Uh, so I want to take the opportunity to thank the research staff from the Office of Research Demonstrations and Employment Support, the Office of Retirement Policy, the Office of Data Exchange and policy publications, and of course, the Office of Research Evaluation and Statistics, whose, uh, whose reviewers uh, served for our program to make sure that our projects were excellent, uh, don't stand up because we don't want to ruin the whole review process. Um, uh, with, with that in mind, again, thank you. I hope you enjoy the conference. Yeah, thank you, John, and uh, thank you for thanking the SSA staff, which I neglected to do, as specifically Lynn Fisher and Brett Trincamp, who I think are both here, and have played a great role in, uh, you know, running our DRC, you know, helping us run our DRC, and they're our interface with the Social Security Administration. Okay, well, that's it for introductory remarks. Uh, we did that very expeditiously, even though we were a little repetitious. <laughs> but that's great. We'll get started a little bit earlier, because I'm sure at some point we'll lag. So we'll go ahead and get started on the first session, which conveniently enough, I am the, uh, the uh, supposed to be the monitor for. So uh, the first session is about workers' compensation and short-term disability insurance. And every year, uh, hundreds of thousands of workers, in fact, millions of workers, uh, experience medical problems, and some of them end up leaving the labor force and entering Social Security Disability Insurance. Uh, many of those workers encounter along the way uh, workers' compensation because they have um, a condition that's related to their work, uh, or if they don't, they may get into a short-term disability insurance program in, of some sort or other. So workers' compensation and short-term disability insurance are 
programs that have the opportunity to help workers stay in the labor force or else help them get on Social Security disability benefits. And what happens in those programs is really critical for Social Security disability programs. So that's why we're uh, having this session today. And our first speaker is uh, Stephanie Renan, who is an associate economist at the RAND Corporation. And I'm pleased to say that it, she's at least a bit a product of the Disability Research Consortium. She spent a summer at Mathematica as a summer fellow, one of our first, and we were delighted to have her there. And uh, so she's gonna present her uh, research on the effect of unconditional cash transfer payments on return to work. And my colleague, Yanni Ben Shalom, who I previously introduced, uh, is going to be the discussant. Please go ahead. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks so much to everyone for being here bright and early. I'm looking forward to a really interesting agenda today, and I'm happy to get things started. Um, by talking about a project I'm working on with Kathleen Mullen, looking at the effect of unconditional cash transfers on return to work for disabled workers. So I probably don't have to remind anyone in this room that very few disabled workers return to work once they begin receiving Social Security disability insurance. So there's a couple explanations for why this might happen. So one explanation is the fact that workers are disincentivized from returning to work because if they earn more than the substantial gainful activity level, their benefits will be discontinued. But it's also true that these benefits provide these individuals with income, and so this might mean that they can also afford to work less than they otherwise might. So these two theoretical concepts are important to think about for policy reasons and a number of welfare reasons, in part because a number of recent programs have targeted return to work interventions, things like the bond demonstrations or ticket to work, and primarily focused on trying to change incentives for individuals to work which is kind of getting at this first channel of the substitution effect. But if instead the main reason that individuals aren't returning to work is simply because now they can afford to work less, these programs might not have a very long, strong impact on return to work outcomes. Um, so this has been noted in a number of papers um, by David Otter and other people who've looked at other programs like veterans benefits where you don't have the substitution effect to try to get a sense of what this income effect channel might look like but there's still a lot we don't know about the strength of this income effect channel for disabled workers. Part of this is because SSDI provides benefits conditional on these beneficiaries remaining out of work, which means the substitution effect or disincentive effect occurs simultaneously with the fact that you're getting more income. So what we're gonna do in this paper is look at a similar population of workers um, who have permanent disabilities but are receiving benefits through workers' compensation where benefits are structured differently and are gonna allow us to disentangle these two channels. So our research question is specifically, what is the impact of an unconditional cash transfer on return to work outcomes for permanently disabled workers? We're going to examine various measures of return to work. So first of all, whether or not an individual decides to participate in the labor force, their level of earnings, and also whether or not they're earning at a level above the substantial gainful activity level. And in order to, to identify the response to this return to work payment, we're gonna take advantage of a large policy change to permanent disability benefits for workers' compensation beneficiaries in the state of Oregon. So I wanna just describe a little bit about workers' compensation and the policy reform we're looking at so that you can understand what we're about in this paper. So when an in a worker is injured at work, they file a workers' compensation claim and immediately their medical benefits are covered and after a waiting period, they begin receiving temporary disability payments. This temporary phase can last a few days or even in some cases up to a few years, as long as the doctor continues to verify that a recovery is in process. But eventually this worker gets to a point where they are not expected to recover anymore. It may be that they've fully recovered from their injury or it may be that they have some degree of permanent disability and the doctor just doesn't expect there to be any further improvement. So at this point, that worker is assessed for a permanent disability payment. And the, the fact that these are permanent injuries here means that there's likely some overlap with the population of individuals who might become eligible for SSDI in the future. And what's key about this payment for our, our paper here is that once an individual is assessed for this award, they receive the payment and it doesn't have any effect on their future work. So they can decide to go back to work after receiving this payment or not, and it's not gonna change anything about the size of this payment that they get. 
Um, these payments are fairly substantial. So in our data, in the state of Oregon, the median payment is around $5,000, or the mean is about $10,000. So this is a substantial sum of money that individuals are getting. So we think it could have an impact on their decision about when or whether they return to work in the future. So the, the reform we're gonna focus on in our paper essentially change the way individuals are rated for this benefit and the formula that's used to calculate the benefit. So before 2005, when an individual was injured, their injury was classified as either a scheduled injury or an unscheduled injury. So scheduled injuries were injuries to particular body parts where there's a very specific listing in the disability guidelines that describes how this disability should be rated. So you can think of this as being similar to listed impairments in SSDI. But unscheduled payments are, are excuse me, unscheduled injuries are basically anything that wasn't specifically listed in the ratings guideline. And there the doctors have a little bit more discretion. So these two types of injuries are rated differently. Scheduled injuries were rated as a percent of impairment to the body part, whereas unscheduled injuries were rated as a percent of impairment to the whole person. And additionally, unscheduled injuries had a functional assessment that determined whether or not there was any work limitation. And this is a process similar to the sociovocational grid that's used in SSDI. So just to give you a quick example, here's an example of a scheduled injury to the thumb. This picture was taken from the disability ratings guidebook for the state of Oregon. And you can see there's very specific directions on how to rate the severity of the disability depending on the extent of the injury to the thumb. So something like this doesn't exist for the unscheduled injuries. So as you can see, this, this kind of just in one picture shows you the impact of this change in the rate, ratings formula and benefit calculation before and after the reform. So along the x-axis here, I have the year of injury. And the darker line, which is dashed, I'm not sure if you, I guess you can kind of tell it's dashed. Um, those are for scheduled injuries. And then the solid lighter line is for unscheduled injuries. And what you can see is prior to the reform, these two injuries track quite closely, or the, the benefit amounts track quite co closely, um, averaging at about $10,000 a year. This is in 2012 dollars. But then there's a sharp separation in 2005, the year in which the reform took place. And you can see in the years after the reform, average benefits for unscheduled injuries increased by an average of about $6,000, where, un or sorry, for scheduled injuries, there was a decrease of about $2,000. So there was a very clear change Essentially, every type of injury received a, a very different benefit after this reform than what they would have gotten before. So in order for us to analyze this, we're going to take advantage of a number of administrative data sources. Um, so we have the universe of indemnity workers' compensation claims from the state of Oregon over a period of about 25 years, from 1987 to 2012. Um, and this is information from the initial filing of the claim. And then we also have information from the end of the claim when individuals are rated for their permanent disability. We have this for a shorter time period, but still you know, over 10 years of data. And then the Oregon Department of Consumer and Business Services and the Oregon Employment Department merged these workers' compensation claims with quarterly wage records from the unemployment insurance database so that we can observe earnings before and after an individual is injured so long as it falls within the time frame when they did the match. So for our sample, we're going to um, focus on the years between 2000 and 2011. So we have a little bit of earnings before and after for everyone in our, in our sample. And we're going to focus on the first time an individual filed for a permanent disability benefit. So excluding anyone who had a claim within the prior 10 years. So we have this change in 2005 where you can see that everyone had a different benefit afterwards than what they would have gotten before. So you might be thinking pre-post, this kind of sounds like something where we might use difference in differences. But the difference here is that we don't really have a pure control group of individuals who were never treated by this reform. But we do, as you could see in that graph, benefits changed in different directions for people. So we have a lot of variation in the extent of the change afterwards. So what we're going to do instead is essentially um, identify the effect of this benefit using a dose-response relationship where we see how much the benefit changed and how that effect returned to work. So one advantage of our administrative data is that we have a lot of detailed information about all the formula inputs that are used to calculate this benefit. And using that information, we can essentially calculate a hypothetical pre-2005 benefit for everyone in our sample, regardless of whether they were injured before or after this change. And use that as a control function that will allow us to separate out the effect of these formula inputs which are associated with the severity of the injury from the size of this benefit payment, which is the effect that we want to isolate. 
So the hypothetical way to think about this is take two people who have the same formula inputs, which I'm calling ZIT here, who have an injury in the different policy regimes and see how their return to work responses compare. So the way we calculate the hypothetical benefit, um, we have a few pieces of data that are really key to allow us to do this. So first of all, we have information about the body part that was injured, and those codes are constant between the two policy regimes. So we can essentially map out whether an injury would have been scheduled or unscheduled to figure out what their benefit would have been in the, both the pre and post regimes. And we have information from the ratings about the severity of the disability and the necessary scaling factors so that we can make those similar, whether it was the whole person or body part, depending on what the injury was. Um, and we're going to use the benefit schedule from 2004 to show a constant benefit for all individuals across the different years in our data. So as we were getting into this, we realized we had to spend a lot of time kind of working through these administrative records to make sure we understood the way the formula inputs were used and, and validate essentially the data that we had. Um, but in the end, we're pretty confident that the data is good. So what these graphs show you along the x-axis here, we took the formula inputs and the formula itself and we tried to calculate the benefit that we expected these individuals to receive and compared that to the amount of benefit that was reported in the data that they received. Um, and so on the left-hand side here, you can see the pre-2005 cohorts, and on the right-hand, the post-2005 cohorts. And in the end, um, after a lot of conversations with our new friends in Oregon, we were able to map about 98% of our, our claims um, pretty closely to the reported amounts in the data. So in order to use this approach of this, using this control function and the policy change, we have to make a few important assumptions. So first of all, we have to assume that these underlying claimant characteristics are orthogonal to the policy change. So essentially there's no change in the composition or the type of worker who's claiming person per permanent disability benefits afterwards. Um, so there's a few things we can check in the data, and I'll show you some examples of that. But another piece of information that makes us feel confident about this is the fact that the policy regime that determined how your benefit calculation is determined by the date of injury rather than the date when, when you're rated. Um, and we think the date of injury is much harder to manipulate than would be the, the date of rating. Um, and also we have to assume that the raters themselves don't change the way they're treating or rating these cases after the fact. So this just shows you a little bit of information about um, claim frequency. So the, the bars show you the overall number of indemnity claims in Oregon in each of these years. And then the solid blue line at the top shows you the share of those claims that eventually receive permanent disability payments. And you can see there's a slight downward trend in overall claims, but things are quite smooth across this policy change in 2005. Um, just to give you a little bit more information about the workers themselves, these four graphs might be a little small, but what they're showing you is different worker characteristics, the age, the pre-injury weekly wage, the um, gender, and one example of the type of injury. And you can see there's some trends in all of these things, but pretty much everything is smooth across the policy change. So workers are about 40 years old on average. Their weekly wage is about $775 a week, um, and about two, or three fourths of them are male. Um, the bottom graph on the left shows the share of injuries that were the result of a muscle strain or sprain, which has a steady decline, but again is, is smooth across our policy change here in 2005. So earlier I showed you the um, average benefit, how that changed pre and post, and here what I've done is taken the actual benefit an individual received minus this hypothetical pre-2005 benefit that we calculated, and you can see that the graph looks pretty much the same, so that Prior to the reform, of course, there's no change since we're using this pre-2005 benefit, but afterwards there's a stark change in um, the benefit level. So unscheduled injuries are receiving a higher benefit and, or, and scheduled injuries are receiving a lower benefit. A little bit of a tongue twister with those, those terms. So this picture here essentially shows you a reduced form kind of first picture of the results. So, what we can see, I'm showing here the probability that a worker returns to work after their claim is closed. And the graph on the left shows you the probability that they return in the first quarter after the close of injury. And the graph on the right shows you the probability of return to work in the first year at the close of injury. Um, again, the solid line is for injuries that were scheduled or would have been considered scheduled um, based on the body part that we can observe in the data. Um, that's the dark line at the top. And then the lighter solid line at the bottom is for unscheduled injuries. And what you can see is that the scheduled injuries had a pretty steady return to work rates, both pre and post. And these are people who had a, a decline but a smaller change in their benefit afterwards. 
Whereas the unscheduled injuries, you can see that there's more separation after the policy change in 2005. So prior to the reform, there was about a four percentage point difference in the probability of return to work in the first quarter for, so that's the graph on the left. And after the reform, this grows to about eight to nine percentage points. And for in the first injury year, there's about a one percentage point difference in the probability of return to work prior to 2005. And then afterwards, this grows to about three to four percentage points. So this is giving us some indication that these unscheduled workers who on average are receiving much larger benefits are returning to work at lower rates after the policy change. So moving forward, we're actively working now to refine our regre regression specification to quantify essentially an elasticity using this policy reform that we've described. Again, using this control function approach where we're going to use this hypothetical benefit to allow us to disentangle these two effects. We're going to examine various dimensions of return to work. So I showed you some graphs on the participation margin, whether or not an individual has returned. But we're also going to look at earnings, earnings above the substantial gainful activity level, and different time frames. Because again, this is a substantial payment, several thousand dollars, but it is not indefinite as it is for SSDI. So we think that there could be some important decisions early on about the duration before an individual returns, or kind of that first quarter, first year, which could be really important to look at. So. I think I'm at red, so I'll stop there, but thank you very much. I look forward to Yanni's comments. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly recap uh, the findings and then uh, provide my comments. Uh, so uh, in this paper, the authors seek to add to our understanding of how the income effect from SSDI benefits may be hindering return to work among SSDI beneficiaries, and they do this by examining outcomes for injured workers who receive permanent partial uh, disability benefits from workers' compensation. Um, they have access to a wealth of relevant information and administrative data from Oregon, and they neatly exploit uh, this exogenous change in the benefit amount uh, to estimate the income effects for these workers, uh, primarily the impact on return to work. Um, their preliminary findings suggest that the more generous PPD payments to those with unscheduled injuries uh, led to worse return to work outcomes relative to those with scheduled injuries who on average saw a drop in their benefits. Um, so I, I don't really have any comments on the methods. Uh, those look to me uh, to be solid as far as I could tell. Um, and I certainly want to commend the authors uh, for pulling together an impressive set of administrative data. Um, I would love to know, know more about how you were able to uh, come by the data. Um, so I'd like to focus my remarks primarily on the difference between PPD and SSDI benefits and uh, to some extent the VA's disability compensation benefits. Uh, but I do have one initial question that stood out to me about the preliminary findings. Um, I don't believe you addressed it head on in the summary, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if the increased generosity for unscheduled injuries associated with worse return to work outcomes uh, I think you'd naturally expect the reduced generosity of scheduled injuries to result in better return to work outcomes. Um, so I, I do understand that this may actually not be the case because of the negative effects of the Great Recession um, and other factors, uh, but I think there's still room to sort of explain why we're not seeing uh, a move in that direction. Um, so I now want to turn to the similar similarities and differences between uh, the programs I mentioned um, so the authors mentioned that SDI, SSDI benefits are conditional on remaining out of work uh, while PPD allows return to work. Um, I just want to be careful about that statement. It's not entirely accurate. Uh, there is a trial work period for SSDI where some level of work is allowed without losing benefits within a certain time frame. Um, so I, I think your point is valid, but you just want to make that uh, nuanced, a bit more nuanced. Um, Another point I would emphasize more clearly is that the SSDI application process essentially requires you to prove that you can't work above SGA, so it's an all or nothing determination, versus here it's a partial benefits determination. Um, and with regards to partial benefits, uh, PPD and disability compensation from the VA um, are to some extent similar in structure, as you mentioned. However, there is a fundamental and very important difference that I think uh, bears attention. Um, you know, the vast majority of PPD claimants who return to work, I assume, do it with their at injury employer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you might have data on that, so it would be great to see the, the split between who returns to their at injury employer versus other employers. Um, and for veterans of disability compensation, that is virtually impossible to go back to their 
to, to military service after they're on disability compensation. And, and I think that's a very important difference. Um, the, the bottom line is that the PPD claimants are very much still attached to the Ed injury employer. Um, again, if you have evidence showing otherwise, I, I'd love to see it. Um, it's also important to note that Oregon has a fairly well-known and long-established program that incentivizes employers to get their workers back to work. Um, they have an employer to injury program that essentially subsidizes a portion of the worker's wage and accommodations. Uh, when they return to the ad injury employer, they also have a preferred worker program that subsidizes uh, wages and accommodations for return to work with other employers. So um, I think they have had this program for quite a while now and uh, there has been some analysis, I think, on how effective it has been. So if you could build that into your research, that would be great. Um, but the attachment to the employer, especially with it above incentives, is, it might be a major reason why the return to work rates are so high, uh, about 90% uh, in the first year. Um, if you compare that to the BA's disability compensation or SSDI, you know, nowhere close. Um, so, so that is, I think, a, a very important factor. Of course, there's probably a mix of impairment that is different. Um, most of these impairments uh, would not qualify a person for SSDI. Um, Another important difference between PPD and SSDI, and to some extent disability compensation from the VA, is the healthcare uh, component. In workers' compensation, the cash benefit is automatically accompanied by healthcare services to treat the condition. Um, in SSDI, el eligibility for healthcare coverage, at least through Medicare, comes way later um, after a two year waiting period. Um, so, especially in this pre ACA period that you're looking at, someone who applied for SSDI. Uh, because of an off-the-job condition, they were not qualified for workers' compensation first, they might have not been insured, so they might have had a very different experience with respect to access to care, uh, which almost surely would have been exacerbating the condition uh, relative to if they had an on-the-job condition and access, immediate access to care. Um, also would have liked to know more about how the scheduled and unscheduled compare with respect to severity, if you can come up with some kind of measure. Uh, who is generally worse off? Um, you know, the fact that the unscheduled saw an increase in benefits uh, suggests that those were more severe and they were sort of somehow correcting for it. Um, so it'd be nice if you could get a more concrete sense of some kind of measure of, I, I guess maybe even, even just the, the percentage of uh, benefits they were getting. Um, finally, I'd like to spend just a, a last minute on policy implications. Uh, I think it would be nice to make a more direct connection to policy implications. Uh, you know, assuming you convincingly establish an income effect and others have already done so, you know, what does that mean for SSDI? Uh, you know, the private disability insurance industry has already implemented some, in a rule of thumb sort of way, you know, 60% replacement rates, um, and there are already more complex structure for replacement rates, both in workers' comp and SSDI. So what, what does that mean uh, if you wanted to design a reform intended to boost return to work rates, like in practice? Um, and if we agree on the fact that the reform in Oregon reduced return to work rates for the unscheduled impairments, uh, what are the spillover effects for SSDI? Uh, it would be great if you could answer that question by matching to SSA data. You could see if these folks are less likely to return to work and therefore more likely to get on SSDI. Um, and finally, what can we say about the well-being of the workers? Those with unscheduled impairments, are they better off after the reform? Uh, on the one hand, the cash payments are higher. On the other hand, they're less likely to return to work, and economic theory would suggest that they are better off in some sense because of the larger income, but what does that mean in real life? Is their mix of leisure and income really better for them if they had returned to work? Would be great if you could shed some light on that aspect, um, somehow bring it into the discussion. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to review the work. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to seeing the final results. Okay, well, I've been reminded to tell you to put your uh, cell phones on. Do not disturb. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the next speaker is uh, my colleague, uh, Kara Contrary. Uh, she's a researcher at Mathematica, and she's been doing disability work for a few years now, and most recently did a project with uh, Yanni and I uh, for the Department of Labor uh, concerning uh, early intervention for workers who uh, experience medical problems. So. Uh, this is very related to that work, although this was a DRC project. Uh, and uh, her discussant is going to be Phil Armour, who is an economist at the RAND Corporation. 
also was a bit of a product of uh, earlier DRC fellowships, I believe. And um, in his relatively short career, he's, he's had several important contributions to the literature on disability policy. Kara? Okay, great. All right, thanks for the opportunity to be here today and talk to you about some work that's done jointly with Yanni Ben Shalom at Mathematica and Brian Gifford at the Integrated Benefits Institute. I'll be talking about early identification of short-term disability claimants who exhaust their benefits and or transfer to long-term disability insurance. So by way of background, um, short-term disability insurance pays partial wage replacements to employees who are temporarily unable to work due to an illness or an injury that is not related to their work. Uh, coverage of short-term disability insurance has grown in recent years uh, with close to 40% of private sector workers covered as of 2014. Most policies replace wages for a fixed length of time. The most common length of coverage is around six months, but some policies do cover up to a year or more. And then because the lost wages are replaced only partially, employees have an incentive to return to work when they recover sufficiently to resume their normal duties. Uh, Short-term disability claimants who are unable to return to work before their benefits expire may then be at higher risk of job loss, of long-term disability insurance claims, uh, and or of entry into Social Security disability insurance. So at this point, relatively little is known about the factors that influence short-term disability duration or about the transition from short-term disability to long-term or Social Security disability benefits. A claim for short-term disability insurance can be an early point of identification of workers with medical conditions who could, with adequate support, remain in the workforce. However, careful timing and targeting of intervention is critical to efficiency. Some workers will return to work without any intervention. Other workers would not benefit from an intervention. In both of those cases, spending resources on early intervention would not result in improved labor force retention. We have two primary research questions. The first is, what observable factors help predict exhaustion of short-term disability benefits uh, and transfers to long-term disability insurance? And the second question is, can waiting for some claims to resolve without intervention improve the efficiency of targeting people for early intervention? Uh, the work that I'm showing today is very preliminary. We have a number of planned extensions, and so we're uh, quite interested in feedback at this point. So looking forward to your comments and questions. The data we use comes from the Integrated Benefits Institute uh, Health and Productivity Benchmarking data from 2011 to 2015. The data include over 820,000 closed short-term disability insurance claims from over 8,500 small, medium, and large businesses associated with nine disability insurance carriers and third-party leave administrators. I want to emphasize that these are private plans. Some states offer statewide short-term disability insurance, but we don't have those claims in our sample. Um, we have two primary outcomes of interest. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on exhaustion of short-term disability benefits, uh, but results were qualitatively similar for the long-term transition. Our first step was to run some logistic regressions with uh, short-term disability insurance exhaustion as the dependent variable, and we generated a predicted probability of exhaustion for each claim. The explanatory variables included a set of individual, employer, and plan characteristics. Uh, for this presentation, I'm going to limit attention to claims that had a maximum benefit duration of 26 weeks, which was the most common maximum duration in our sample. The individual characteristics that were most strongly associated with exhausting short-term disability benefits were age and diagnosis category. So for individuals age 55 and over, the probability of exhausting short-term disability benefits was six percentage points higher than among individuals ages 18 to 24. Among diagnosis categories, by far the diagnosis most strongly associated with benefit exhaustion was cancer. Claims with a cancer diagnosis were 11 percentage points more likely to reach maximum duration uh, than claims for a reference category. And I want to point out that back pain and mental health disorders 
uh, which together constitute a large share of Social Security Disability Insurance awards are also positively associated with exhausting benefits. Employer industry was also strongly associated with short-term disability exhaustion. Employment in agriculture, mining, construction, transportation, and utilities was associated with a three to six percentage point higher probability of exhausting social security benefits, um, or sorry, short-term disability benefits uh, than any other industry category. Uh, so before moving on, I wanna level set by briefly going over a couple of definitions to keep in mind. So the, the exercise of flagging individuals as high risk uh, for exhausting short-term disability benefits based on their uh, prob predicted probability from a model generates four categories of classification. True positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative. Uh, in what follows, I'm gonna focus on the true and false positives. True positives are claims which would exhaust short-term disability benefits under usual practice that get flagged as high risk by the model. False positives are claims which are also flagged as high risk uh, under the model, but which under usual practice would not uh, exhaust short-term disability benefits. Okay, so our second phase, uh, we constructed receiver operating characteristic curves for our model, and these curves illustrate the relationship between the true positive rate and the false positive rate as the probability threshold for flagging claims as high risk changes. So usually there's a, tr there's a trade off in that uh, changing the probability threshold to increase the true positive rate would also increase the false positive rate. We conducted separate analyses by claim duration. We first looked at the set of all claims initiated, and then we limited to claims that lasted a minimum of two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks. And we assessed the predictive accuracy of our models using the area under the ROC curve. So in general, a higher area under the curve indicates better predictive accuracy. Um, so for example, a lower false positive rate for a given true positive rate. However, the area under the curve doesn't give any guidance as to the optimal probability threshold, so the optimal um, probability uh, where you flag a claim as high risk. So for that, we used Uden's index, which is the point on the ROC curve which maximizes the difference of the true positive rate and false positive rate. To avoid overfitting our model, we used a split sample approach. We randomly divided our sample into a modeling half and a validating half. We use the first half in the regressions, and then we use the estimated coefficients to generate predicted probabilities for the second half. So on this slide, there's an example of an ROC curve, just to help give some intuition about what these curves are. Uh, so focus on the solid curve, which represents the model that I've introduced. Um, the figure shows an ROC curve and a Uden's index for this particular sample of claims. Uh, the predictive accuracy of the model increases as the ROC curve bows out more towards the northwest corner of the quadrant. Um, classification via Uden's index in this case would identify about 60% of the short-term disability insurance exhausters, but then it would miss 40%. Um, and similarly, it correctly identifies 60% of the non-exhausters, but would flag about 40% of non-exhausters for intervention. So this table shows the predictive accuracy of our model over time as weighting allows some of the claims to resolve on their own. So the first thing to notice is, um, as you can see in column two, attrition from the sample is relatively rapid. By week six, almost 50% of claims have resolved. Uh, however, the predictive accuracy of the model doesn't seem to improve with claim duration. Uh, in column three, you can see that if anything, uh, predictive accuracy as captured by the area under the curve declines as known negatives drop out of the sample. However, the efficiency of targeting does improve with time. By week six compared to week zero, the model would flag only half as many claims as high risk. So going from about 40% to about 21% of all claims being flagged as high risk. So this has the potential to reduce the costs of the intervention. Um, however, note that the true positive rate in column five, so the percentage of claims that would exhaust short-term disability under usual practice that get flagged as high risk, that that rate declines only slightly relative to the number of claims targeted. 
So the delay doesn't appear to result in missing large numbers of high-risk claims. So waiting serves the function of eliminating false positives from the set of claims targeted. As you can see in the last column, the false positive rate is halved um, over the six-week period from 35% to 17%. So that was about the benefits of waiting. Uh, to understand the advantages of modeling short-term disability insurance benefit exhaustion, uh, it's useful to compare the results from using a predictive model to the results from a, an option we just call attrition alone. So that would involve waiting a number of weeks to allow some of the claims to resolve and then targeting all claims that survive to that uh, duration. Compared to attrition alone, modeling at six weeks results in targeting fewer than half as many claims. So depending on the cost structure of the intervention, this could represent significant savings. The trade-off is that modeling captures only 60% rather than 100% of the claims that under usual practice would exhaust short-term disability benefits. Uh, however, remember that the attrition approach would then flag all remaining claims for intervention. So the hit taken on the true positive rate may be worthwhile because, as you can see in the last column here, the false positive rate is reduced by over 60%. So in this sample, that means uh, 75,000 false positives rather than 160,000 false positives. Okay. So the strength of our approach is that it uses a large data set of private short-term disability insurance claims and commonly used and well understood predictive accuracy metrics. However, we still have a lot to do. So we estimated uh, a very basic model in which all of the independent variables enter linearly. We next plan to test whether more complex models can improve predictive accuracy. Uh, another option would be to use uh, some type of machine learning protocol to identify constellations of characteristics that are highly predictive of short-term disability insurance exhaustion. Second, uh, regarding our prediction metrics, both the area under the curve and Uden's index treat the true positive rate and the false positive rate as equally important components of predictive accuracy. So in the context of early intervention to promote labor force retention, that means that these metrics um, you know, um, treat equally the risk of providing a treatment to somebody who wouldn't benefit from it um, or who doesn't need it and the risk of failing to provide a treatment to somebody who could benefit from it. Um, so in reality, which one receives uh, higher weight depends on a number of factors. Um, this could include the cost of the intervention, uh, the effectiveness of the intervention, the costs associated with progressing from short-term to long-term disability or to social security. Um, in the future work, uh, we're gonna try to more precisely characterize these trade-offs. So to summarize, in the context of private short-term disability insurance, we find that waiting allows claims that will resolve without intervention to do so, and that modeling based on observable characteristics can further narrow the target population. So there's therefore, there's potentially quite a bit of scope for increasing the efficiency of early intervention efforts. As we saw in the predictive accuracy table, waiting appears to be low-hanging fruit. Um, many claims resolve pretty quickly, eliminating potential false positives uh, from the, the set subject to early intervention efforts. Modeling is a bit harder. Uh, in order to uh, get accurate predictions, you need a lot of information or potentially better techniques to improve prediction. And there's always the consideration that uh, a certain fraction of individuals who could be uh, helped by intervention um, would be missed or would be not flagged under any modeling protocol. Um, so in addition to the, the uh, technical extensions that I mentioned earlier, some types of additional information that could potentially improve modeling. Um, in uh, the Washington State COE model, they use a pain screen. Uh, if there's access to medical records or medical claims, that could be useful. And then in, a, in addition, more specific information about um, the employee's job, uh, job characteristics uh, might be useful for improving predictive accuracy. So I'm just about out of time. If you have questions uh, that don't get touched on today, you can contact myself or Yanni at the information on screen. Thank you.
All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss this paper. Uh, I see this kind of another paper in the, the line of early intervention research that's coming out of Mathematica that's been, I think, very interesting, looking at not just focusing on the disabled population that's already on kind of these long-term disability programs, but seeing kind of right when a health condition starts to interfere with somebody's ability to work, what are the interventions that, that can be kind of be deployed at that point? Um, you know, one of the issues with studying this, though, is that, you know, DI is a, you know, an SSI, they're large federal programs, right, that cover lots of, potentially cover a lot of working age Americans, and these early intervention programs are much more scattered, right, that you have some states, a handful of states with their own um, temporary disability insurance programs, you have private short-term disability insurance, um, you have workers' compensation, you have also policies like disability discrimination laws that can vary state by state, um, and vocational rehabilitation services also, right, and that's just on the civilian side. There's also, you know, different policies and programs for service members and reservists and veterans. Um, and, and these programs, they all kind of differ dramatically uh, when it looks at like what's the cause of the injury or illness, how long is, it, you know, is, are, you, is, are you kind of expected to take before recovering, are medical benefits included, um, what are the incentives for employers and, and employees, um, and also, you know, where do you live? Uh, so, you know, with this, it's kind of, it can be difficult to navigate all these systems and kind of varying levels of success, or even like different definitions of what success is. Right, for, for these um, d temporary disability insurance programs, it's return to work, that's fairly clear. For workers' compensation, there's also you know, a medical recovery factor since, since the, your uh, medical claims are included, right? But the hope is that kind of through careful study of these programs, we can glean sort of important lessons for best practices on sort of which, which interventions work you know, and for whom, um, because we know that kind of not all conditions and workers and interventions are, are created equally. So you know, enter this paper, which is kind of right, right along this line of research. Uh, a, a couple things about it. First of all, it's da data I haven't seen um, before, so it's from uh, you know, private DI insurers, so there's questions I'm gonna have for the authors just offline about kind of similar to the, the questions uh, that Yanni had for, for his staff about how do you get it and all these other components. Um, but it, and with this data in hand, the, the researchers then go on to kind of fit a model of transitions or, or really focusing on exhaustion of short-term disability insurance benefits, right? So this is the population they see is at risk of then going on to these long-term disability programs. Um, but, you know, instead of just fitting a model and then kind of calling a day, or calling it a day, right, they do something a little savvier, which is they fit a model on part of the data and then use kind of a, a split sample approach to see, you know, how accurate is this? How many kind of true positives, people who, you know, are going to exhaust benefits and then, then are at risk of, of going on to long-term programs, do they capture um, and how many do they miss? Um, and I think this is a really great way to, to tie it directly to policy, right? This is Figuring out how to, how to flag these people is kind of the first step um, in then delivering intervention services. Um, and their, their conclusions, right? Uh, they have a couple of them. First of all, that like prediction is sort of possible and powerful, um, and also in particular that waiting can really help kind of target the intervention, right? Uh, there are a couple of broad questions I have for them. Um, so in this and kind of what I've seen so far, they, they focus on exhaustion of the short-term disability insurance benefits and and I point out that they don't have kind of full data on the long-term disability insurance benefits, right? But what are kind of the, what are the people that you do see for that data? What fraction of those who exhaust the short-term go on to private long-term? Um, if it's not within this data, are there kind of other data sets you can use to try to get a sense of, you know, is it, is it half, is it a quarter? What, what are we talking about um, on that set? Uh, I think another thing, and especially some of the research that's been coming out of um, the Alcoa data set, is that there are individuals who have kind of even, even though they might not exhaust their short-term disability insurance, they might have multiple spells, right? So they, they go on and then they recover a bit and go off and then, then have a new claim later on. Um, even though they're not exhausting benefits, this is probably also another population that, that could be well served by uh, targeting interventions. Um, also kind of what other outcomes uh, can, can you measure here, right? Like, so here we're looking just at exhaustion. You know, ideally we'd like to see kind of earnings in general and a lot of health data, all that kind of stuff would be great. Um, but I mean, do you even have a kind of employment at the same firm might be something that, that again, as, as you already pointed out previously, um, you know, these, these individuals might have uh, substantial attachment to that, that, that um, same firm and seeing how many go back to work um, could be a nice, nice additional outcome. Um, another thing that seems like a good complementary approach could be kind of a duration analysis, right? Not just did they exhaust it, but how long are these benefits lasting, or how long is, are these claims lasting? Um, it's sort of oftentimes hard to use duration analyses in disability studies because you don't know kind of when the, when the conditions first started interfering with work, but in your data you actually do, so that's, um, that'd be great. Uh, you know, a couple of things just to drill down on their findings. Um, 
you know, they, they have this, this issue where the predictive accuracy falls as you kind of wait longer. Um, that didn't really surprise or kind of concern me. One of the reasons is, you know, you start with a very heterogeneous pool, um, and, you know, there's some people, some claims that are just going to last for a couple weeks, right? The longer you wait, the more they look like longer term um, disability insurance claims, uh, and so the more homogenous they are, the harder it is for observables alone to be able to kind of tease apart, you know, which are the ones that are going to end early versus later. Um, also, why, why isn't it concerning? Well, there's, you know, their predictive accuracy drops a bit, but half of the claims have already closed, right, which means there are far fewer um, false positives in absolute terms, right? Um, and so this is really important when thinking about what are the interventions under consideration. I think this is where I want to take my comments um, from here on out, is thinking about, okay, they've, they've kind of taken a, a couple of different modeling assumptions, uh, and I think it's, it's a, a, a great first start. And I think the next steps are thinking about what interve interventions are you thinking about, and then how do those affect these assumptions that you're talking about? Right, so if it is a costly intervention, something like employer accommodations or things like that, or subsidizing you know, wages, things like that, uh, you know, it might actually, you, know, you might, might be worried you don't have the budget to, to really to finance everybody on these claims, and so you really do need to, to limit the number of false positives you have quite a bit. Um, and to, uh, to give kind of a sense of their numbers, right, their overall data started with about 450,000 claims, um, and then after six weeks, it dropped to 225,000, so it halved. Right? Then when they applied modeling, right, they got it down to basically 94,000 they targeted. Um, so, so that was basically like over 360,000 people that, they're, that are false positives they're no longer targeting. Right? And they lost out on kind of 12,000 people who they should have targeted but missed. Right? So that's kind of for every one person they missed, there are 30 people that you know, they save money on that, that it wouldn't have been, it you know, would have been an unnecessary intervention. So one for 30, like it, what's that, is that a good trade-off? Is that a bad trade-off, right? And I think it really matters, again, what intervention we're talking about, right? So if it's, if it's an information intervention, one of my favorites, uh, you know, it's one of those things that maybe you're not so concerned that you're sending things out, you know, emails or letters to people who aren't gonna respond to it. What you're really concerned about is making sure everybody who can respond to it, who it's gonna be effective for, is getting the letter. So, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it, it's not as important to avoid these false, false positives. If it is something instead, you know, like vocational rehabilitation, maybe scalability is a big issue, right? It's gonna be difficult, so you really need to cut down on those false positives, positives quite a bit. Um, also, I think when thinking about the interventions, the usefulness of wait, waiting is a great way to narrow down the, the, the sample to those who are going to, um, a greater fraction are going to be um, exhausting their benefits, but if the intervention itself has greater effectiveness early on, right, that's also obviously something that you want to take into consideration. So that's another trade-off you want to do when, you, when you're doing the, the modeling component. Um, none of these are really kind of criticisms. They're just sort of, you've, you've done a, a great sort of first step of these are the different issues, these are, these are how you can limit the pool. Um, but, uh, but I think it, it sort of, when, the next step is thinking about, okay, I've got this intervention in hand, what are the right choices um, to make? Uh, so, uh, yeah, and I think one, one step on that could be, you know, costing out the model with an existing intervention, you know, something like the, the COE system or something like that. Um, but in, in general, I think, uh, you know, the paper does a great job of sort of conducting this disability analysis with sort of policy making in mind, right? Trying to get out of this a, a way to actually flag individuals going forward. Um, and I kind of look forward to, to future work on, on intervent early interventions along this, these lines. Thank you. So uh, Phil mentioned that there are a handful of states, in fact five, that have uh, mandatory temporary disability insurance programs. And the next speaker, Justine Hastings, who's at Brown, happens to live in one of those states, Rhode Island, and she's going to be talking about the temporary disability insurance in Rhode Island program and its effect on maternal uh, and newborn outcomes. Uh, there are quite a few people interested in these five states right now because of early intervention. One of them ha happens to be David Mann, who works with me at Mathematica, and, and who is Annette Bourbonnier, who's from Rhode Island and sitting over here, uh, did a separate study on uh, the Rhode Island data for short-term disability, so he's going to uh, do the discussing. Justine? Um, great. Thank you all for, uh, for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me to be here and to talk about this new work on 
uh, temporary disability insurance in Rhode Island. Um, this is joint work with Zach Campbell, Ian Chin, and Eric Chin. Uh, and it is, uh, actually we have a pair of papers on temporary disability insurance uh, that we originally had as one paper, uh, but we decided to focus them into two because there's really two functions of this program. Uh, since there was a ruling that pregnancy and recovery from, from birth actually qualifies as a disability. So each of these programs kind of has two functions. Um, one is for what we think of typical injury uh, that doesn't happen at work. Uh, so for example, spraining your back or you may have uh, some, some stress that becomes almost like a temporary disability. Um, the other is actually just uh, a way of providing uh, state mandated uh, paid leave through the unemployment insurance system. And at the moment, paid maternity leave is an important policy debate. Many of us have heard about it. Uh, this is one of Ivanka's, Ivanka Trump's uh, key initiatives that she uh, would like to push forward. Uh, and that's because the US is unique among developed countries. There is no national paid leave policy. There is a national unpaid leave policy where mothers uh, at firms, I believe, over uh, 50 employees uh, through the FMLA uh, are allowed to take unpaid leave, but there is no paid leave policy. Um, except in these five states, through temporary disability insurance, there is in fact a paid leave policy as mothers can withdraw funds for uh, covering a portion, approximately 60% of their earnings uh, while they recover from pregnancy um, or leading up to giving birth. Proponents for paid leave argue that it provides financial support to low-income mothers who may not be able to save precautionarily uh, or don't save precautionarily uh, before giving birth. Um, and that by having this paid leave, it encourages or helps mothers uh, afford to take time after birth uh, for important goals of parent and child bonding, family health and well-being, um, and also to recover themselves and invest time in their new family, uh, which can enable workforce stability and economic stability. So women in these five states, of which Rhode Island is one, the great state of Rhode Island, uh, and my, uh, my home state of California is another, New Jersey, Hawaii, I believe. I'm not gonna be able to name the five of them off the top of my head. Uh, they all have paid leave, and it's funded through the unemployment insurance system. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at measuring the impact of this paid leave by focusing on qualification thresholds. So we're going to use a regression discontinuity approach to measure the impact on mother and child outcomes. And we're going to use a new comprehensive administrative database from the Rhode Island uh, Innovative Policy Lab, a lab that I started in partnership with the governor of Rhode Island uh, approximately two years ago. Uh, and this database is gonna allow us to measure the causal impact uh, on very low income mothers near the qualification threshold of TDI qualification and benefits receipt on a wide range of labor, economic, health, and childhood development outcomes. Uh, these outcomes are going to include uh, many measures uh, ranging from, uh, from health at birth uh, to mother's labor force participation, whether she returns to uh, the job she had before going on leave, um, to whether she uh, follows through with timely immunizations for her child, uh, to child's uh, test scores once they're uh, of test taking age in school. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how temporary disability insurance works. Um, as I mentioned, it's funded through the unemployment insurance system, uh, which, uh, and the uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance payroll tax. Um, it's gonna provide approximately 60% of, uh, of earnings replacement for non-work-related injury or illness recovery. Um, and as I mentioned, since 1978, this covers pregnancy and postpartum recovery. So to qualify, mothers need to contribute enough to the system before the claim, and there are a handful of ways that they can contribute, quote unquote, enough. 
uh, they can earn approximately $11,000 within one year before the claim if they're kind of working steadily. They can also earn, they can also qualify by earning a lot in one quarter and kind of a small amount in other quarters. So you can either have kind of steady low income, high variance but low income. So there are a handful of ways that, that your income can add up to quote unquote enough. Mothers can claim up to 30 weeks of TDI benefits and they need a doctor's note or approval. Um, they can't work during the claim, but they can take paid leave from their employer simultaneously. So imagine that you did have uh, maternity, paid maternity leave through your employer. Taking TDI doesn't somehow reduce that paid leave. You can't take TDI if you're actually working, you have to be not working, but if you're receiving maternity leave payments while you're not working, you can still receive your TDI payments. So that's kind of important way that this program works. Um, benefits for a mother who is earning about $10,000 a year um, at the typical amount of leave that they file for, which I'll show you is about 10 to 11 weeks, um, are about $1,200. So this is a pretty substantial amount of money when you're thinking about affording necessary care items for your home and your newborn child. Um, there's a cap of benefits per week at about $817, uh, which means that benefits kind of cap out for a mother who would be earning about $70-ish thousand dollars a year. Okay, so we're going to use this data from the uh, Rhode Island Innovative Policy Lab, also known as Ripple, uh, the Ripple RI360 database. Um, it is a relational database, anonymized and secure. Uh, and it goes back through the 90s and it covers almost all administrative data sets in Rhode Island um, as well as some, act some additional private vendor uh, data. Um, and it allows us to measure actual claims, births, labor market outcomes, and measures of investment in childhood development. And so what we're going to do is we're going to construct this claims data. We have TDI records, uh, UI records, wage records, and birth records. And we're going to construct basically two samples. Um, and I'm going to kind of show, look at results for two samples. There's two ways to think about these samples. One is we actually know all births in Rhode Island. So low-income mothers, many of them don't qualify uh, for TDI. Also, for very low-income mothers, many of them qualify but don't claim. So you can imagine taking all births, and when you cross the threshold, you can see who actually files for a claim. The other way that you can look at this is you can look at all claimants, so people who actually file a claim, and those who just don't quite make qualification won't get the benefits, and those uh, who do make qualification uh, do get the benefits. Um, and so there's kind of two samples on which we can estimate the, uh, this uh, causal impact. Um, one thing to note about uh, regression discontinuity design is that TDI actually benefits mothers at all income levels who have worked enough. Um, we don't have randomization of TDI across the entire income distribution, unfortunately. Uh, so instead, to get the causal impact, we're going to be focusing on this regression discontinuity around the qualification threshold, which means we necessarily are looking for a causal impact among very low income mothers. So our results are not necessarily going to apply to, let's say, mothers who are earning $60,000 a year or $50,000 a year, uh, but we may be interested particularly in these very low income mothers, and the reason is that those are the ones for which we're most concerned and spend a lot of money and effort uh, targeting interventions at birth, such as home visiting programs, et cetera, to kind of really make sure that those mothers have resources to give that child and themselves uh, a good start in life. So outcomes of interest, labor force participation, we're going to have any work, their earnings, earnings conditional on any work, whether they return to work at, their prior at a prior employer. We're going to measure these at Q4, after quarter four after birth, uh, quarter four through seven, so that's the year after the year after giving birth. Uh, and then quarters four through 11, which is the two years after the year after giving birth. Um, mother's economic well-being will also be able to look at enrollment in SNAP, TANF, and Medicaid. 
Um, and we're also going to be able to look at subsequent enrollment in permanent disability, SSI program, um, as well as further use of the TDI program. Uh, we're going to look at measures of child health at birth. So we're going to use birth weight, APGAR score, uh, days in neonatal intensive care unit, uh, gestational length, and we'll look at measures of child development, whether or not mother takes up some of these vital home visiting programs, since she has uh, these earn this TDI uh, benefits, she might have time to do that, subsequent fertility, immunizations uh, by age two, whether the child is in need of, of uh, has special needs um, and is in an individualized education program once they reach school and standardized test scores. Um, so briefly to let you know how mothers use TDI across the income distribution, what you can see is that mothers, when they file for TDI, are typically taking 10 to 11 weeks off, um, slightly lower for the lowest income mothers, but again, also slightly lower for the highest income mothers uh, as opportunity cost of time may go up. When do mothers take TDI? They typically take it right after birth. So the median mother is taking TDI benefits a couple weeks after birth. Some mothers take it slightly be before birth. So kind of uh, what we find is that if we were to look at, uh, for example, uh, health at birth, approximately 25% of mothers would have taken these benefits in time to potentially impact health at birth. Um, prior literature, which is in this literature that has not had access to the actual claims, has focused only on health at birth, and so this kind of questions that approach, given that most mothers, at least in Rhode Island, are not taking it during that time period. What does threshold crossing look like? So first we have our claimant sample, second we have all births, and what you can see is that in both there's a clear jump, a regression discontinuity, in the probability that the mother takes the TDI program uh, in the amount of dollars that she takes uh, and in the number of weeks she takes off. And what you can see is that the all birth sample has a lower jump than the claimant sample because approximately 60% of qualifying mothers aren't filing in this, in this region of, uh, of income. So what do we find? We see these, uh, sorry, we see these enormous jumps uh, in, and clear jumps in qualification in total dollars of benefits received and in weeks of TDI benefits taken. Do we see similar jumps uh, in outcomes? And the answer is that we don't um, see, find significant jumps or significant impacts uh, in most of, the pro uh, most of the outcomes that we look at. Um, we do not find significant impact on employment uh, or on earnings um, or on enrollment in social assistant programs. Uh, we do uh, find um, some impacts, actually, uh, positive impacts on SSI enrollment uh, from crossing the threshold. So one mechanism may be that mothers file for TDI uh, and then they learn more about other programs that are there to benefit them, and this kind of can increase uh, take up of, of the SSI program. Um, one thing about Rhode Island is that approximately 15% of people work out of state, uh, and so for our low-earning mothers, we may wonder if A, they are working in a higher income household, or B, if they have wage income from out of state, so they're not in fact very low income. So what we do is we also run this entire set of regressions um, and analysis on what we call a social assistance subsample. Even though somebody works out of state and they don't show up in the wage rule data, all of their income is reported for any social insurance program that they're signed up on. And we also do see if mother is married at birth, and so we do also have the father's wages. And so for the social insurance sample, we're able to focus on mothers and families who clearly are um, qualifying for social safety net programs uh, with some time in the uh, handful of years before birth. Um, and we, we also don't see an, a significant impact among this group. Um, overall, our findings are insignificant. They are noisy. Uh, we're able to rule out some of the large impacts identified in state-level difference and differences estimates uh, in the prior literature. Um, 
Uh, but uh, really the only uh, significant impact that we're finding is this uh, slight uh, positive significant impact on SSI enrollment. Um, for health at birth and childhood outcomes, we also don't find any uh, prior, uh, we don't find any significant impacts. Um, we find marginally positive impacts on IEP once at school age, which may also be partly a function of SSI. Um, and as I was uh, rereading my rereading my draft and my slides before coming down here, I realized we have not looked at SSI enrollment of the child, uh, and that's an outcome that we should add to our analysis, which would be great. Um, so, in conclusion, I think uh, U.S.-based studies using difference and difference approaches that have been done on uh, measuring the impact of TDI uh, in the in the recent uh, years um, have found kind of big impacts. Uh, they use difference and difference approaches and also survey response data for earnings and employment from things like the CPS and the NLSY. They found very large impacts of uh, threshold, of basically, sorry, of TDI, uh, state level TDI programs on uh, mothers, measures of mothers' labor force participation. Um, we use administrative records in an RD design. This necessarily focuses on very low income women. Um, so we have lower power, but we do fail to find significant impacts on a wide range of labor market outcomes. Um, and uh, as we uh, wrap up the second half of this set of two papers, which focuses on uh, injury, I can give you a little bit of a preview that we find uh, similar results. There seems to be an impact of threshold crossing for TDA qualification on subsequent TDI use. Uh, and disability program insurance uh, enrollment, uh, but not so much when we look at labor market outcomes, for example. So that's it. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Mann. I'm a senior researcher at Mathematica. I would like to start my remarks by thanking Justine and her collaborators for the opportunity to review uh, this interesting study. I will uh, start my remarks with uh, some background and a recap of the findings and then make some suggestions about potential follow-up studies for the TDI program. Although not typically featured in discussions about disability policy, maternity benefits are typically covered by mandatory public short-term disability insurance programs. Like the interesting features of other disability support programs, the inclusion of maternity benefits in the TDI program can be traced back to the early history of the program. When the Cash Sickness Program, which was TDI's original name, was first authorized in Rhode Island in 1942, women comprised between 40 and 50 percent of the labor force in the state due to the labor market effects of World War II. Consequently, although not part of the authorizing legislation's original intent, the cash sickness program authorized benefits for maternity, and TDI still provides those benefits today. A descriptive study I recently conducted with Annette Berunier uh, that used recent TDI administrative data to examine the program found that, about, that maternity claims uh, comprise about 13% of all TDI claims. The authors use a regression discontinuity a regression discontinuity design focused around the earnings threshold for program eligibility to identify causal effects of the TDI program. Now this approach means that program effects were measured among individuals with very low income, which may have implications for how applicable the findings are to, to all TDI claimants. Among the various results, two that stand out to me are the labor market and SSI payment receipt results. Specifically, the authors find no program impacts on labor market outcomes and a slight increase in SSI payment receipt among TDI claimants. Regarding the SSI result, I was thinking about why this could be, and I did think about um, Justine's hypothesis that it could be that TDI is making individuals more aware of the uh, SSI program. However, they don't, you would, if that were true, you would also potentially see effects for other programs uh, that are in the data and you don't see that, you don't see upticks in, in TANF and, and SNAP uh, receipt uh, in the data. So 
Um, I don't know if that hypothesis is, is the right one. Um, the SSI result um, is for payments uh, based on the mother's status. Uh, I was going to suggest that they also eventually look at um, SSI payments based on the child's status, but it seemed that, that Justine uh, beat me to it, uh, that suggestion. Um, the authors uh, also, uh, this was not mentioned, but the authors also use machine learning techniques and no less regression to further examine claimant outcomes, um, but without a source of exogeneity to uh, identify causal effects. Uh, in a future study, the authors may want to examine the potential of using kinks in the wage replenishment rate at the TDI and minimum and maximum benefit amounts to identify causal effects. Uh, though the kink at the benefit minimum may not provide much more additional information given the regression discontinuity designs use of the eligibility threshold, examining changes in the wage replenishment weight rate at the benefit maximum may provide additional insight into the program. I think that future work on the TDI program has multiple potential directions, in part due to the data, data available in the Rhode Island Innovative Policy Lab database. Although the exact de contents of the database are not mentioned in the paper, the database is described as administrative data from major Rhode Island government agencies. From the rich information included in the study, I suspect that the database would be use useful for examining interests of outcomes for people with disability. Noticeably missing from the study's outcomes are Social Security Disability Insurance and Medicare benefit receipt. I suspect that the authors have at least examined the potential of linking their database to administrative data for these programs, which would provide additional measures that could help inform disability policy. I, I see two immediate directions for uh, TDI studies. The first direction would be to perform a similar analysis as was done for this study on the majority of TDI claimants, that is, the non-maternity claimants. Although the set of outcomes would need to change somewhat, removing any focus on maternity and newborn outcomes, examining the labor market behavior and benefit receipt of low-income workers who are near the threshold for quali qualifying for TDI benefits would likely yield policy-relevant information about workers with disabilities who typically earn substantially, substantively less than workers without disabilities. The second direction would be to use information in the database to explore the potential uh, to which the TDI program is an early signal of long-term disability benefit receipt for non-maternity TDI claimants. One of the reasons Annette, I, and others have shown interest in the TDI program as well as other mandatory public short-term disability programs is their potential as a form of early intervention. Evidence suggests that the probability of return to the labor market decreases over time among those who stop working due to the onset or worsening of a condition that interferes with work. In the states that have them, short-term disability insurance programs may be the first program that people with disabilities who stop working apply for support from. Consequently, the TDI program um, and pro the TDI program and other programs like it provide policymakers with an opportunity to identify early potential long-term disability beneficiaries and provide them with the supports that they need to re-enter the labor force and delay or avoid long-term disability benefit receipt. With the ability to look at various outcomes of interest beyond the TDI benefit receipt period, the Rhode Island Innovative Policy Lab relational database can, could show just how many TDI claimants go on to receive certain types of long-term benefits, as well as how benefit receipt varies across claimant characteristics. This information could inform efforts by policymakers currently underway in the state of Rhode Island to explore the creation of a hybrid temporary disability insurance program that, that facilitates treating and rehabilitating workers with medical conditions that were not caused by work. The TDI program also has an optional return to work benefit that provides more, a more limited cash benefit to claimants who transition into work part time before leaving the TDI roles and hopefully returning to work. The 
my study with Annette examined how claiming characteristics vary by partial return to work benefit utilization status. The database used for the maternity benefit study could also be used to examine the extent to which various TDI claimant outcomes differ by utilization of this TDI program feature. Thank you. Thank you, presenters and discussants. So we, it looks like we have about 20 minutes for, um, yeah, is that right, 20 minutes? Yeah, Tw 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I didn't hear the discussants say anything that demanded an immediate response from the presenters. So let me just open it up for the, uh, the audience. I believe we have microphones. Do we have two microphones? Three microphones. But maybe the microphone holders could hold their hands up and uh, put your hand up and they will come to you. And Annette Bermonier right here has her hand up. We recognize the gentle lady from... Rhode Island. And yet it's not a Rhode Island question. Uh, this is actually a question for the uh, first speaker, Catherine. Yes. Uh, on the um, partial permanent disability payments in Oregon, now those are all people who are receiving workers' compensation. Is that correct? So they don't need to go through the long waiting period of no income before changing their benefits. So that, that would be one thing I would be wanting to look at is that difference. But I would also be uh, interested in finding out those unscheduled disabilities um, and if you're looking for really a, a medical recovery on those. There may be more of um, unscheduled disabilities. A lot of people tend to not believe they're real disabilities, so therefore there's more of an adversarial effect on those, and could that be the reason why the partial, um, permanent partial disability does not have as strong an effect on return to work as the, it does on the ones with the scheduled disabilities? Yeah, thanks, those are really good comments. Um, so for the first point, yeah, you're right that workers' compensation claims can start immediately after the injury, and you can receive benefits in the temporary system before you reach this point when you're assessed for PPD. So these people don't tend to have a very, really any gap in between their injury and when they start receiving benefits. Um, so we were, one thing we thought was interesting is thinking about kind of what happens at the point when they receive this benefit and then they have this transition time where they have a large amount of income and maybe are no longer on the program. So that's an interesting gap at the end of the claim that we're, we're trying to get at and thinking about transitions or potential early intervention. Um, to the other point about unscheduled injuries, that's a good point. So we, even there, um, every injury in our database is tied to a particular kind of body part or body system. So these are things that are just a little bit, I don't know, things more like back pain, I'm trying to think of some other examples, or um, maybe more whole system or whole body injuries rather than to a particular body part. So. They're a little bit different in the ways that they're assessed, um, and there could also be some differences in severity, which is one of the things we're looking at, as, as Yoni said. Um, so that might be one reason why we see these, these differences, but they're all kind of tied back to particular body parts in our data. So thank you, that was a good point. Any next question? Yes, over here. Hi, Joanne Schneider, Chrysalis Collaborations in George Washington. University. Um, these are all wonderful papers and really interesting results. I think all of them, frankly, would benefit in getting to the why by including some qualitative data as well. So I'd encourage all of you to look at to that. Um, the question comment I have is for the second paper. And I was very interested to see that the industries were all industries that were physical labor industries. But then I was thinking, so who in these industries qualifies for private short-term disability insurance? And so I'm wondering if you looked at the job categories and whether that had any impact on your model? Thanks for the question. Um, unfortunately, we don't have information about the individual's jobs in our data set. Um, the, the only thing we know is the employer industry. And I agree that um, 
I think, as I mentioned, having information about the type of job that somebody um, was in prior to their injury or illness would be really useful for uh, improving, you know, prediction of, um, you know, transition to, to longer-term disability. Can I follow up on that? Uh, I, I think um, I, I think that the fact if you have disability insurance or not might m be more affected by who your employer is and what your actual job is within that employer. I think, I mean, as far as I know, employers don't sort of segregate their disability policies to certain types of workers versus others. But, but if you could elaborate, yeah, that would be useful. Do, but I think the bigger issue here is quick case study. Someone in construction I know who was injured physically could not go back to the work he was doing as opposed to someone who's an accountant who could go back to the work he was doing, right? And that guy became depressed, long time story, currently on SSDI, okay? okay so right. it's I that totally kind of thing that. I'm thinking yes. about. I'm talking about who, who has access to private disability insurance versus not. Yeah. Somebody from this side, hold up your end of the bargain here. In the middle. Well, you've already had your turn. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. My name is Heidi Jackson. I'm with the Census Bureau. I actually had a question on the final paper, uh, Justine's paper on temporary disability insurance. And it's a really interesting null finding with respect to birth weight, and that there wasn't any difference in receipt of um, TDI if a person filed before the birth of the child. And I was wondering if that null finding might actually be driven by the fact that maybe women with high-risk pregnancies are, in fact, opting in to receiving disability insurance before the birth of the child. And if you've looked at it all, if the characteristics of the women who file for TDI before the child's birth differ from those who file after. Great, thanks for that question. So, um, so to be clear, we're looking at a regression discontinuity estimate and we're conditioning on the date of filing. So both people who, who crossed the threshold and didn't cross the threshold all filed at the same time. So we take the whole sample of people who cross the threshold versus don't and we only look at the subsample of all of those who filed two weeks before birth. So there's not a selection bias in that estimate. However, there is an interesting question to answer, which is, are there just different characteristics of, of mothers who decide to file early versus late? Um, and that we haven't looked into, but would be simple to do as an appendix table with some summary statistics, just to describe what are the differences in characteristics of mothers who are filing at least two weeks before birth versus after? You're welcome. Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Tom Clode with the Senate Finance Committee. That, that was kind of my question as well about the Rhode Island study. I was just curious if there was any effort to um, unpack more about access to prenatal care before before the enrollment in the program or to look at that, uh, look at what, what was occurring there? Um, so is the question whether low-income mothers are getting prenatal care or whether TDI is, is somehow causing more prenatal care? What, like what specifically, what relationship specifically are you interested in between prenatal care and TDI? I was curious if you're, study had any indication as to who was getting prenatal care and who wasn't getting prenatal care? Um, okay, so there's there are a handful of things to keep in mind. First is that when we're looking at a regression discontinuity on either side of the threshold, things are, are on average the same, every observable characteristics and unobservable characteristics. So it's kind of like tossing a coin between people who just qualify and don't. So when you saw those big jumps in, in TDI benefit receipt, Basically, people just to the right and just to the left of that cutoff are the same on all observable characteristics, including, for example, prenatal care. So prenatal care does not influence the causal impacts that we estimate. However, understanding how TDI receipt impacts access to you know, post-birth care or access to the many uh, or use of the many um, programs that we have for helping very low-income mothers, for example, home visiting programs, that is something that we can look at as an outcome. Did crossing that threshold impact mothers uh, 
enrollment in those programs, and we don't find that moms are more likely to take home visiting, even if they now have this, these extra funds from TDI. Um, as far as prenatal visits, we didn't look at whether or not mothers who file for TDI and qualify long enough to have, let's say, their last prenatal visit um, or a very you know, close to birth prenatal visits have more prenatal visits. We could add that as an additional outcome. Um, I think in general, understanding, you know, we have several projects with the Department of Health uh, and the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, um, understanding how TDI and other programs meant to help these low-income mothers, how can we make them even higher impact at potentially lower cost. So we're doing some creative projects with uh, home visiting programs that are kind of lighter touch but potentially more effective. Um, so in many related projects that we have going on at the lab, we have probably about 40 projects uh, covering everything from energy policy to social insurance policy, food stamps, education, uh, uh, closing the, the childhood achievement gap. Um, we have approximately 30 data scientists, economists, and policy analysts working on these full time. Uh, so among these projects, we definitely have a whole group of projects aimed at, uh, at health at birth and what we can do to help very low income mothers Get, uh, get a solid start in life for their children since we know that that can have big impacts on, uh, on what, what, uh, what happens even before third grade and at third grade test scores. Uh, those gaps that we're all very concerned about in childhood development emerge very early and we're working very hard to figure out uh, low cost creative ways to address that issue. Thanks, others? David. Bring the mic down. Yes, you do. Yeah. Hi, uh, David Otter, uh, MIT and the NBR Disability Research Center. So, uh, a comment and a question on the paper that uh, Stephanie and Kathleen gave on the sort of the, uh, cash payments for uh, disability. So that's I think it's really fascinating. It's actually a really fascinating institution and a fascinating set of results and a really creative study. That's a, it seems like. Uh, an excellent design. Um, so first one comment and then a, then a question. So the comment is, uh, it is really important to understand the effect through which, the degree to which benefits programs affect behavior through incentives versus just giving income because incentive effects are distortionary. They, you know, you're, some people say, well, disability programs are, you know, pay people not to work. And income effects, which are just the pure effect of having higher wealth, is, is not distortionary. If people have more income and they decide not to work, that's their choice and, you know, Presumably, they're making the best choice for themselves. Something that distinguishes uh, SSDI uh, and other contingent cash transfer programs from pure income transfer programs, like the kind that Stephanie is discussing, is that um, it's a it's an, in the form of an annuity, meaning a stream of cash payments that continues indefinitely until you reach full retirement age or uh, pass away. And so, uh, an annuity program has a strong incentive. Uh, component, even if it's just cash, because if you exit that program, you lose access to a, stream, a guaranteed stream of benefits, not just a cash transfer. So although SSDI has a large cash value, the kind of option value of maintaining it because it's an indefinite commitment is greater than its simple cash value. It has this additional insurance po property that makes it very powerful and, and gives you strong incentives not to uh, exit the program. Um, my question, so that was a comment, yeah. uh, my... Uh, <laughs> My question is, um, you know, it, this is this is just a great setting to look at this, you know, benefits programs as cash out or one-time transfers. And I wonder if there are other examples of this, and if anyone has even, for example, another country, you know, looked at this as an alternative to the annuity payment structure. So, for example, you could imagine a disability program that says, okay, here's a, a one-time payment uh, for, uh, you know, for the injury you have or, or you know, loss of work capacity, and then health insurance is maintained, but the cash transfer component is one time. Or even in most countries, of course, health insurance would be a kind of, you know, uh, provided regardless, it would be independent disability status in, in, in most uh, uh, modern countries. Um, 
So anyway, I'm just wondering if you know more about that or if you have other studies underway, because uh, it seems such a promising and interesting area. Thank you. That comment is, I think, right on point. That's a really, really important distinction to think about, and I think that's one reason in part why we're interested in thinking about maybe shorter term outcomes since this is not an annuity payment. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know of any like big policies in other countries or things of that nature, but one other feature that um, in this study that we haven't had a chance to exploit yet, but we're planning to, is there is variation in how individuals receive this payment. Um, so typically for the smaller um, awards, they're provided in a lump sum, whereas if they're over a certain threshold, they're provided out in monthly installments until the total award is exhausted. So again, it's not a complete annuity for all time, but it is a little bit more of that flavor of annuity. So that's another feature we're hoping to exploit. At this point, probably it's looking like it would be another paper, but um, I guess stay tuned. It's, it's definitely an area worth exploring more in the future. Thanks. Is there another hand up over here? Yes. Yeah, hi, Lisa Ekman with the National Organization of Social Security. Claimants representatives, and my comment kind of follows on, on David Otters, and I think it is really important to think about health insurance when you're thinking about these populations. And it's not an incentive that SSDI creates, it's an incentive that our health programs create um, by tying access to these services and supports people with disabilities need to an income support benefit. So we certainly need to address that. But I'm wondering if um, you thought at all about, especially with workers' compensation, where all healthcare costs are not paid by the individual, but at rather paid by the employer and the insurance, what impact that has on the outcomes for people. So for example, often people can't afford all the treatment that is uh, prescribed or all of the rehab that might help them get back to work if they don't have, first of all, any health insurance at that time, and second of all, if their health insurance is inadequate or has high co-payments or high co-insurance. And that, for both of the first two papers, I think the third one, I'm not sure that's an applicable question, but thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Health insurance is a really important component here. Um, I didn't touch on it as much, uh, in part because we unfortunately don't have a ton of information on medical claims in our data, but you're right that they're completely covered as long as it's something associated with the injury. Um, I guess one thing that we've been thinking about, sort of a policy implication again, is that this in a way could be another source of early intervention for these individuals, that they don't have to wait, there's not a two-year gap like there is when they're applying for SSDI, and so they're able to kind of have this is health insurance and medical payments covered from the beginning to help them potentially recover more quickly. Um, maybe I'll go back to Oregon and see if we can get some more data on health insurance to, to look at that more carefully. Yeah. Others? Um, oh, go, yeah, yeah, I'll respond in the yeah. context of uh, private disability insurance. Uh, presumably most of these people also have health insurance with their employers, um, but I think there's a lot of variation to the deg degree that there's any sort of uh, coordination between the disability insurers and the health insurers. Um, you know, I, I would think that the typical case, the worker is pretty much on their own interacting with their physician. Uh, you know, the physician might be giving the private disability insurers some forms that are required to receive the benefits, but otherwise they would be relying on their physician to receive their care and their health insurance program will determine, you know, what their out-of-pocket costs. Um, so unless they're working for a very proactive employer that is sort of asking the, the, the various parties to work together and have some structure within the employer to sort of have a proactive return to work program, you know, the worker will be navigating these two benefits pretty much on their own. Um, so what kind of health insurance coverage they have um, will be very important, I think, to how their, their, their condition is treated. Others? Yes. Hi, Mar Marcia Katz, retired from the University of Montana and Social Security Advisory Board and currently still very active with ADAPT. Um, I have a question on the, uh, kind of a question comment on the third paper. The threshold was an economic one, um, earnings, as, as opposed to an FTE. And at $10,000 a year in earnings, if that, that's the, the low end of the threshold, that's about two-thirds time FTE. So I'm assuming then that women did not have to be employed at any particular um, rate in terms of FTE in order to be eligible. And also, given that you focused on low-income women, 
Um, I'm wondering if the lack of uh, change in labor force participation afterward is because as low income women, they have to survive and they don't have the luxury of not going back to work or taking longer periods off. So a couple of questions, uh, let me unpack there. I think there's a couple of questions. Um, one is that these are low income women. They are, we, sh we have some descriptive uh, data in the uh, paper, which I think with only 15 minutes, we kind of skip over a lot of that. Uh, and so in the paper, we show that these, they are more likely to work, for example, in the retail sector, in the food services sector, in places where you would think that somebody is not necessarily kind of permanently working full time. Um, and so uh, these are people who have sporadic employment, uh, they're low income, they may be changing jobs a lot. Um, and uh, we don't see evidence that they, for example, take a, a shorter amount of time off of work uh, what, as, a, uh, as a result of threshold crossing uh, or a longer amount of time off of work. Uh, they take approximately the same amount of time uh, as as they do if they don't cross the threshold. So if you think about somebody earning $10,000 a year, now they have an extra you know, $1,000, which is a substantial amount more money. Um, that's not increasing like the large amount of time that they're taking off of work. Um, and that may be due to pressure for, uh, you know, to return to work quickly, but we don't see that they're kind of taking less than the 10 weeks, if you remember the first graph. It's not like they're kind of only taking three weeks or something like that. Yeah, um, so they are taking that amount, but it is true, your point, that it doesn't look like they're kind of saying, okay, well, I would have taken four weeks, but now that I have this temporary disability insurance, I take eight weeks. And I think the hypothesis with what is the impact on subsequent employment, you know, there is a hypothesis that, uh, you know, in that immediate quarter right after birth, you maybe take a little bit more time with your child. We don't see evidence of that. There is a hypothesis that this uh, being able to do that helps you kind of taking that leave time helps you uh, bond more with your child and also invest in your own health, which then gives you more stability later uh, through the employment sector. And so we don't really see that. Um, away from the threshold uh, in results that we didn't talk about, we do, uh, but uh, David mentioned briefly, uh, we do actually use machine learning techniques, a method called double lasso. Uh, to control as much as we can for uh, an unprecedented number of, of observable characteristics between people who file and don't file. Um, and there, you know, I think there is some positive effects in, in one particular area for, uh, on, on labor force participation, um, but I, I think that those um, demonstrate that those, those are likely biased by unobservable selection, and we don't see that supported throughout the income distribution. So I'd be happy to talk to you more about those kind of non-causal or non-experimental results further where we're kind of figuring out what's the best we can do away from that threshold as far as estimating impacts. Thanks, thanks, Justine. Uh, so we do have to wrap up. We've gone a minute over, but I hate to interrupt that. Yes? May I ask just a quick word? Uh, okay, we're, we are over, so make it quick. I, I just want to come back around to the issue of privately insured individuals privately insured for disability and the communication and cooperation. It's more likely uh, that the private disability insurer is bringing expertise to the employer. Some employers may have it, but it's more likely that the uh, private insurer is bringing expertise and being proactive with the physician, with the, tr with the, the providers. Uh, this is especially true for companies such as Cigna, which are both in the medical expense and the disability space, and Anthem, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I realize we're over, but I did want to make that point. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you, Winthrop. Yeah, I hate to interrupt discussion. You know, it takes, always takes time to get going, and then uh, right, right when it gets going, you have to stop. So, but anyway, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a less than 15 minute break. We'll start again promptly at, uh, uh, 10.30 and uh, with the next panel. Thank you.